Um, so first up, I have to assure you that my intentions are honorable. I, I'm not intending to be uh, absurdly mean or nasty. I'm just here to talk about an issue that's near and dear to my heart. Um, my name is uh, Casey Hanmer. I'm here to talk about confronting the credibility gap for crude exploration to Mars. I took the red eye from LA this morning, so if I'm slightly incoherent, please wave. Um, if you can't hear me, please wave. Can everyone hear me? Uh, people at the back? OK, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, and I just uh, want to point out just how wonderful this, this photo here from the uh, Curiosity rover is of the sheep bed formation. Uh, imagine being on Mars and, and seeing this sky glow from the, from the sun and thinking, oh, I'll just walk to the top of that mountain. It can't be that far away. <laughs> Um, first up, who am I? Um, I'm new to, this, new to this conference. I've never been before. I'm, I'm somewhat young by the standards of the presenters you've watched this morning. Um, in my younger years, uh, on the left there, I used to climb mountains in the Sierras in full evening uh, wear. Um, I did a PhD in gravitational waves at, at Caltech and got the opportunity to sword fight my professor um, in an industry kind of magazine. Uh, it's on the bottom left there. Uh, and nowadays, I'm levitating Hyperloop. And in Mars stuff, I actually um, 3D printed a, a ring just so I could you know, carry it around and remind myself what the, what the overall goal was. Uh, and then more recently, I did a, a quick paper on uh, predicting kind of flow over the surface of Mars. It turns out since the flows, the last major flows in, say, the early Amazonian, there's been true polar wander and other major crustal and geoid shifts. And not all the rivers work the same way you might expect them to. So it's wise to know where the water's going to go before you melt it, right? Um, so first up. Um, I'm an enthusiast, uh, die-hard uh, enthusiast for Mars exploration and extended habitation. I'm not here to say it can't be done. I'm not here to push my own personal theories and my personal kind of agendas on Mars exploration. Uh, I'm just here to talk about a serious issue, which is, which is credibility. Um, and I mean, I don't need to convince any of you here in this room that going to Mars is a good idea. Uh, and I think any attempt to do so would be kind of obsequious and pointless. Um, but you know, outside, not that far away, uh, is an entire universe full of people who who don't know that much about Mars, don't really care that much about Mars. When it comes to space exploration, they're like, wow, doesn't that cost like all the money in the universe? Um, their, their opinions range from ignorance to ambivalence to skepticism. And, and my point here is that this is not entirely unfair. Um, it's certainly possible to put a better foot forward than we as a community currently have been. Uh, we can do more to stamp out uh, or discourage um, you know, crazy, uh, crazy kind of talk that, that tends to harm the credibility on a, on a kind of public level platform. Um, and there's actually, there's an internal aspect to this as well. It's just it's a matter of, of making sure that the journalists out there are kind of getting things right most of the time and that Hollywood is doing cool, cool movies and so on. We also have to look ourselves in the eye and be like, well, could we be doing this better? I think we can. Uh, and then just uh, towards the end, I'm going to dig into a couple of core engineering challenges that I think illustrate my point um, rather well uh, and hopefully get this all finished up uh, well before my time is up so we can uh, have some time for questions. I'm just going to start a timer here so I have some vague idea of how much time I've used. All right. First up, let's talk about the role of the media. I think Mars One is patient zero for this case. Um, I googled Mars One credibility last week when I made this slide, and I got 189,000 hits. Um, and the first six are people will die, people will die. Uh, at this very conference last year, a couple of students from MIT taught the CEO, someone whose job it is 24 hours a day, seven days a week for two or three years at this point, to know all the answers, to shreds in a public debate with such issues as, do you realize the nitrogen will run out on day 59? And have you thought about how to drop more than two tons onto the Mars surface, something I'll talk about later on? This is, you know, it's a pretty serious issue. Um, I mean, it's kind of good for laughs uh, around the pub late at night. but. Um, you know, this is the darker side of publicity. Uh, Mars One is the most public, by far, kind of thing, except maybe the movie The Martian that's come out in the last 10 years. And, and now it, it cannot really be mentioned without sniggers and derision. So how did this happen? Um, I mean, when it first came out, I thought, that's kind of cool. And then I was like, mm, I'm not so sure about that. But even until, until quite recently, you know, no shortage of people uh, within this community, outside this community, and so on are like, yeah, that sounds legit. Um, let's talk about the media. I mean, I'm part of the Mars Society. Uh, group on Facebook, and you know some of these articles come up from time to time. Um, and it's important to realize that the the headline may not be the best indicator for the accuracy of the article. And I, I read all these articles, and actually they're mostly pretty good. Uh, most of the writers who cover this sort of stuff do care about it. Um, I actually emailed a bunch of them and was like, "Hey, 
let's talk about this. And they were like pretty friendly about it, which is cool. Um, but this is kind of the generic human factors, human factors problem. So on the left, we've got heart disease, depression, and blindness, the hazards of space travel. Space travel. That came, was based on a paper that came out about six weeks ago, uh, basically looking at seven Apollo astronauts who've died of heart disease-related issues, potentially, uh, thereby proving that deep space radiation uh, kills your heart. Uh, I might point out that all these Apollo astronauts have already died. Um, most of them died in their 70s and 80s, which is actually not too bad for guys who drank and smoked and drove fast cars and carried on like they did back in the day. Um, that was kind of pointed out by other people, and I think the paper's been retracted. Um, never, needless to say, there's actually uh, the Observer Business and Technology published an almost identical article uh, there on the bottom right, and both of them have different pictures of depressed astronauts. Like, there's more than one stock photo for a depressed astronaut. Um, and then on the top right, we've got the kind of mythical propulsion system uh, case, which, which is always kind of grinds my gears. Um, if I may borrow an American phrase, uh, as someone with a PhD in physics, I kind of think about this quite a lot. Uh, so the, the three-day propulsion system, that's how long it takes you to get to Mars if you accelerate 1G uh, the whole way. Um, you don't need a, a spinning kind of you know, tether-type system that, uh, advocated in Mars Direct. You just turn on the rockets at 1G the whole way. You get there three days later. How you slow down, that's another issue. How you get back, don't even ask. Um, but oh, and all you need to do that is a laser that's a million, million times more powerful than the most powerful laser we've currently got. And then you're just gonna shoot that at your spaceship and it's not gonna melt. Um, <laughs> You know, like, this is, this is a serious issue. And it, it really bothers me, actually. You probably can't see there, but the writer's name uh, is Michael Casey, and my name's Casey, so that's just, it's personal. Um, wait, there's more. I've got the, the references on the bottom there. It's not too difficult to find articles like this. Uh, since I made this talk a week ago, there's been about 10 more of the same sort. I don't really intend to spend the entire talk uh, shooting fish in a barrel like this. Uh, after all, it's, it's very easy to criticize. These are people doing their jobs. Uh, they just need clicks and money like the rest of us. Um, but on the left here, we've got NASA's warp drive project, uh, but apparently won't save you from cal cancer or Alzheimer's. Well, given that 80% of us are gonna get cancer or Alzheimer's and die of them anyway, like, I guess the odds are not too bad in that regard. Um, needless to say, I'm going to put on my PhD hat here. Warp drive is uh, not real. Um, sorry. Uh, although on the next picture, we've got the picture of the warp drive spaceship. Um, they've already designed it. They know how many windows are in the front of it. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's just stock footage. Um, that's the EM drive. The EM drive's been kicking around for about 12 years. Originally, it was based on like, oh, if we miscalculate some vessel function in a like closed cavity, we get like f fancy that, like some net movement. Um, turns out you can calculate vessel functions. I mean, if this worked, then every time someone played a trumpet, they'd accelerate to like the speed of sound. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and, and actually, if you look at the very bottom there, um, it says uh, for 2.5 kilowatts, you know, only the cost of like a really big microwave, you can get a whole 720 millinewtons of force, which is, you know, probably enough to like scare a mouse, maybe. Um, so, I mean, like, even if it worked, it would still be worse than the best Hall effect thrust as we have right now, uh, in terms of, like, the amount of thrust per kilowatt you get out. On the, on the top right there, we have Mars in 39 days. Um, I actually emailed this, this writer, Jonathan O'Callaghan. He was super cool. Um, so this is the Vasimir engine that's kind of been doing the rounds for a long time. I think it's really cool technology, and it's cool that NASA continues to kick them some cash to develop it. But it's important to realize that until you've got like a gigawatt nuclear reactor that works in space, you basically have to use chemical rockets to get from place to place if you want to get there in a hurry, which humans generally do. Uh, and then on the bottom, we've got, is NASA's impossible fuel three thruster, gee, that's hard to say, a step closer to reality. Uh, and the controversial EM drive is to finally undergo peer review. Well, I've published a few papers. Peer review is not as exciting as it sounds. Um, the, um, I mean, like, people have tried to replicate this experiment, and every now and then they're like, oh, you know, we put eight bajillion volts into it, and it moved a little bit. I mean, like, if it didn't move at all, wouldn't that be more surprising? Um, so, here's, here's kind of question for you, and this marks the end of the first part of my talk, which is, you know, not all of us here have the, the luxury to be able to spend most of their first decade uh, as adults reading Wikipedia articles on the finer points of propulsion theory, or I live in Los Angeles every now and then I kind of run into a SpaceXer and they, they kind of tell me some stuff. Um, so can you detect articles that have a high degree of bullshit? Um, there are red flags, yeah, you can. Um, you know, you can kind of tell when something's not quite right, and this is useful when you're talking to your family and your friends and your networks and kind of deciding whether or not to repost that article. Uh, if in doubt, ask questions. You know, it's a Socratic method. Um, they, they killed him for it, but it, these days we should be okay, at least until January 20th. Um, check Google, check Quora. Uh, if you've heard, who here's heard of Quora? Great, 
I hope you're all members and you're they're writing out articles about stuff and, and answering questions and so on. It's a lot of fun. Uh, Facebook, Mars Society has a Facebook page. Uh, it's a pretty good place to go there and share knowledge if you have expert knowledge on this or to find out stuff if you're not quite sure. And Twitter is always an option if you want to be told you're wrong by a thousand people. Um, if it violates the laws of physics, probably not true. If it suggests transit times are less than 90 days, um, double check. Uh, if it involves warp drive, that's super cool, but it's also not real. Sorry. Actually, even if it was real, and I did the math on this, uh, it would still be less efficient than chemical rockets or, or even electric propulsion or something. Like, if you think you need a gigawatt nuclear reactor to power your Vasimir engine to go to Mars in 39 days or something, uh, to get a warp bubble up and running, you need to, like, the, the mass energy of Jupiter. Like, like, <laughs> like, like, the sun doesn't produce that much power in a year. Um, and to go to Mars, yeah, not really worth it. Um, if you've got content-free hand-wringing over psych factors, like, oh my god, the aliens are going to, sorry, the aliens, the astronauts are going to go crazy and start eating each other's faces. Um, okay, maybe. Um, but at the very least, you'd want to see, like, some study or some reference to an article or, like, we looked at statistics for how people won't go crazy on long duration uh, ship voyages. My, my fiance currently lives in Antarctica where she's been for 10 months. You know, like, these things are actually areas of, of study, but, but the content-free kind of like, uh, astronauts go crazy is like slow news, slow news day times 100. Um, if there's no quotations or endorsement from recognized experts, trash it. Uh, if there's no reference to peer-reviewed papers, why bother? Uh, if there's a naked agenda, I mean, there's a lot of kind of to and froing about the uh, ARM mission, about the Mars flyby, about whether we go to the moon first, or an astronaut first, or Mars first, or low Earth orbit first, or just spend a whole bunch of money and feel good about it. Um, you know, like, you have to be aware that, that everyone has an opinion and, 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 and articles sometimes tend to push one person's point of view more than others. Um, and that's, I think, a really unfortunate kind of point of view, which is when outsiders look in and they scratch the surface, they, they see a whole bunch of kind of people who should know better than to bicker about stuff which ultimately comes down to personal preference. Um, and then later, la lastly, if the, uh, if the headline poses a question with an obvious answer and that obvious answer is no. Uh, so what can we do? Make sure. Um, that if you're on social media, that you're, you're kind of getting out there. If you're an expert, make sure that media organizations have you on your Rolodex. It didn't take me very long to find the email addresses of all the people who wrote these articles and go through and be like, yo, what up? Uh, I work with the Science and Entertainment Exchange. It's really cool. Uh, writers in LA, take me out for lunch and, uh, and ask me like, so you're a physicist, how can I destroy the world? And I'm like, well, don't tell my officer at the U U uh, USCIS, I'm trying to get a green card, but... Um, and this, this, I think, is, is probably a, a positive step. I think, really, a, a, as an organization, Mars Society could do a lot of good by, by really kind of embracing social media wholeheartedly, spreading its message. I mean, Elon Musk has way more followers than we do. He says crazy stuff all the time. Uh, the, the news I've heard on the inside from SpaceX is that, that Elon will convince the world that uh, space-based nuclear reactors are OK with, like, 140 characters. Um, so we're all good, right? Well, not really. Let's have a look on the inside. Uh, and this is, this is the painful part. It's, it's really easy to look at journalists and writers and be like, ah, oh, barely scientifically literate, whatever. Like, actually, a lot of them are actually pretty damn good. Um, it's much harder to look at ourselves and be like, well, this thing I said once, it wasn't so smart. Or I made a mistake, but I'm human. That's OK. We all make mistakes. Let's move on. Um, so it's important to realize that even on the inside, um, the adv advocacy can be a little bit off. Uh, as some examples here, I'm just going to jump in. Uh, Elon Musk a couple of years ago was like, oh, radiation's no problem, we'll just put a disk of water between, you know, like a column of water between the astronaut and the sun, uh, which is fine, provided the column of water is of similar spatial extent as the gyro radius of protons in the solar wind, which is about 1,000 kilometers. Um, you know, this, this, is, this is stuff. I mean, Elon's a smart guy. He obviously, you know, forgot his coffee that morning. Um, Next up, we've got uh, the original version of the Mars Direct mission sequence, which lists a launch in 1997, seven years after the, the original proposed thing. I mean, like, I was, I was, I think I saw that slide in the flesh back in 96 when Mars Direct book first came out. I was very excited by it. Um, but over-optimistic timelines can harm credibility. Um, I mean, it's all very well to look at launch windows and say, well, like, uh, we can do the Mars flyby in 2019 or 2021 or something like that, uh, which is kind of cool, like Voyager opportunities. Uh, but in reference to the previous talk, I mean, of the 540 days you spend in space, how many of them can you actually look out the window and see a planet? About an hour for 540 days. Oh, we can take CubeSats too. Well, you can take CubeSats without humans as well. So like, I'm not particularly criticizing that particular mission, but it's, it's worth pointing out that, that uh, you know, if you're going to say, well, we're going to do all this and we're going to do it really soon, um, people start to look at you funny. Uh, 
Mars Society is not the only person, they're not the only organization that suffers this problem. SpaceX was going to launch their Falcon Heavy four years ago. Um, and this is the most recent thing they tried to launch, um, which is really sad. I, I know people at, at SpaceX, and it broke their heart, ruined their whole day. Um, I mean, like, uh, the last Falcon that exploded blew up on Elon's birthday, and it's not, not, not fun. Um, so uh, I'm not going to dwell on this particular area for, for too much longer, um, except that uh, I think that uh, our very own Bob's article in the Wall Street Journal four years ago suggesting to basically extend the Gemini mission by uh, two years and 50 weeks um, is, is a, perhaps an example of something that while, uh, you know, if you are an expert right in the know, you can be like, well, yeah, I could understand how this might work if you could find people who thought this was a good idea. And if you were like, well, the opportunity cost here is, well, we don't develop a giant booster, but we'll just get on with the job. Um, but as, as a member of the general public or even someone who knows a bit about engineering or has built airplanes before reading that, you're like, okay, you want to cram two people into an SUV for three years just so you can say you've done it. I don't, you know, like there's, it's, uh, it's, it's an issue where, you know, there are, real, there are real concrete challenges here which are not addressed in this proposal or, or any other proposal I've seen for landing people on Mars, really. Uh, and all you've got to do is kind of a mentality that, that has permeated the aerospace industry but, but doesn't cut it anymore. Um, no amount of, of, of adjustment to an attitude to risk can really change the fact that, that in this day and age, it's not good enough to sacrifice human lives for no reason unless it's like war in the Middle East or something. Um, so let's move on to some more concrete examples. Uh, I don't want to kind of harangue you any longer than I have to on these issues. Let's talk about entry, descent, and landing. So um, I'm going to step away from the microphone for a second so I can point at the screen. I'm going to speak up. And again, if you can't hear me, just wave. Um, here we have a, a diagram that uh, explains how you go from space to the surface of Mars. This is velocity in kilometers a second and this is altitude in kilometers. You start out here at about 5.7 kilometers a second, which is the escape velocity from Mars. This is the velocity you pick up as you fall in from space. Uh, Pathfinder came in a little hot, and Viking started in, in Martian orbit. And then you shoot down here, and by about this point, you're in terminal velocity, which on the surface of Mars is around about Mach 2, 500 meters a second. Uh, and by this point, you've let off 99% of your energy, which is super cool. Uh, but this is the first stage, which is the, the entry part, which is what you need the heat shield for. Um, and there's this parameter, um, step back to the microphone, there's a parameter called the ballistic coefficient, um, which is simply the mass of the spacecraft divided by the surface area of its heat shield. Uh, and those are those numbers I've written up on the right-hand side there. Uh, Viking Pathfinder 64 down to MSL at 155 uh, kilograms per square meter. You can think about this as a surface density. Uh, it's, it's the amount of mass, you know, it, it's something like a parameter for the thickness of the spacecraft. Um, and it's really, really constrained. Uh, this is a problem. The Mars atmosphere is super thin. That helps when it comes time to come home, which I'll talk about later. Um, but on the way in, if you, if you sharpen your ballistic coefficient much more, you'll simply um, run into a lipid bond, which is about this high. Uh, or you'll come in and you'll have inadequate time to execute the remaining steps of the landing sequence before you crash into the ground and make a very unfortunate crater. Um, so... Uh, essentially, you're constrained by the total surface area that you can fit inside a payload fairing uh, in terms of the size of your heat shield. Uh, if we imagine a rocket with a payload fairing of 10 meter diameter, something like the original uh, Mars Direct plan, uh, and not too dissimilar from, from numbers I've seen thrown about on various SpaceX-oriented uh, Reddit forums and so on, that constrains you to a total mass of 11 tons, uh, which is a very, very wide, very thin flying saucer. Uh, and any thicker than that, you know, I'm, I'm talking like barely two meters tall, 10 meters wide, uh, circular cross section, anything more than that, and you are crashing into the ground uh, with, with this kind of blunt body, minimal lift entering, entering bodies. Now, there is some potential ways of fixing this problem, which will be discussed by the next speaker. I don't want to steal his thunder. Um, but this is a problem that's been recognized within the community since 2004, when, when Rob Manning uh, pulled to get together a bunch of experts at, at JPL. Uh, and it hasn't, there's, there's still no real dominant architecture that like is obviously the correct way to solve this problem. Um, so that's, that's kind of, that's kind of the, the, main, the main big problem, which is that if you want to get large chunks of mass onto the surface of Mars all at once, shrug. Um, 
let's see if I missed any key points here. Oh yeah, Adam Stelzner, uh, who's got a fabulous hairdo, uh, has a really cool book uh, that's a pretty good introduction to these sort of problems for the robotic scale one tonnish payloads that they're, they're currently flying there. Um, the second st stage of this problem is, is the descent problem. Uh, uh, Bob mentioned this earlier in his talk. Uh, on the right, we have the Kerbal Space Program solution, and on the left, we have LDSD, which is an attempt to extrapolate Viking-era um, hypersonic parachute deployment to slightly larger diameter parachutes unsuccessfully. Um, and even if it was successful, we would still suffer an issue here, which is that um, the masses of payload, uh, mass of parachute increases um, much faster than the mass of the object it's supporting. This is pretty obvious. If you look at the, the cross section of the shrouds has to scale with the mass, has to support the weight, and the overall area has to scale with the mass to keep the ballistic coefficient at the right sort of level you want. Uh, and so the overall mass of the parachute scales like the mass of the vehicle, at least to the power of 1.5. And even if that was the case, your, uh, your parachute can still break because it has all kinds of weird transient loads. It has to be able to inflate quickly enough. Um, Parachutes are a kind of a nightmare, even at, even at this scale. Uh, and, and for kind of 100 tons or 50 tons or 20 tons on the surface, you're talking parachute the size of a stadium. Uh, and in all seriousness, uh, Rob Manning's team, this is his book here, he discusses it in chapter five, uh, couldn't imagine a way uh, to open a parachute of that size in time uh, before, before you've kind of run out of that last little bit on the bottom corner of the distance speed curve and uh, made a very unfortunate crater. Um, so, so at this point, you know, we don't really know how to get from 5.7 kilometers a second down to about 500, and we don't really know how to get from 500 down to some subsonic speed where you can fire your entry rockets, but at least we know that uh, subsonic uh, landing rockets will probably work. Uh, the last issue I'd like to mention is the getting from Earth to Mars problem, which is always kind of neglected when you think about this. It's obviously the hardest part by far because there's no launch ops on the surface of Mars. You have to bring everything with you. It's at the end of the mission. All the machinery is tired. The astronauts are probably pretty skinny by that point, which helps. Um, but the margins are razor thin. Um, so um, you, know, you have to have your deep space life support system working forever. And th there's two basic ideas that you see here. One is that you take a super light spacecraft, like the uh, LES system I've sketched up on the right there, or uh, the Constellation Mars Ascent Vehicle on the right there, which if you can see the picture, it seems to be like literally throwing out pieces of money. Um, and and that, that rendezvous with some giant Battlestar Galactica in low, Earth, uh, low Mars orbit, which then flies you home, which is, which is kind of a, a, an un, unfortunate degree of, of programmatic cost and risk. Or you have some direct Mars ascent, like the, the Mars direct architecture on the left there. Uh, but the Mars ascent vehicle is always kind of in the background and a bit shadowed because it's not really clear where the stage ends and where the, where the capsule begins. If you have to have you know, enough space to support four astronauts for, si uh, for six months on the way home, it's, it's a quite, a large, quite a large volume uh, to, to land on the surface of Mars, even though uh, undoubtedly the surface of Mars is the easiest place to get the fuel to come home. Uh, it's, it's a very difficult, complicated problem. And no matter which way you slice it, you can't really do with less than, say, 10 tons on the surface for a, for a Mars Ascent vehicle or perhaps 100 tons for an Earth return vehicle. Um, and that's just way beyond the masses we've talked about, uh, constrained by uh, entry, entry um, vehicles, parachutes, and stuff like that. I'm not saying the problems are impossible. I've thought about them a lot. I think, I think SpaceX will tell us a lot about them next week, and our, our next speaker will refer to them. Um, I'm just saying like, these are two core issues that have not really been addressed. Uh, and as enthusiasts and people who are interested in this, we should be thinking and discussing and talking about this a lot more. Um, and I'm very happy to talk about this with you uh, right now or after the talk. Let's see. Oh, and I have a book about this. It's free at my website, caseyhammer.com slash home slash Mars. It's about 40 pages at the moment, and it discusses 24, uh, 22 other undeveloped uh, technological areas uh, related to Mars exploration and, and uh, communi uh, exploration and, and extended stay. Um, any questions? <clears throat> um, Bob, you may go first. Do you have a question, please?
Okay, I mean, like, this is this is a specific issue, Bob. Um, are you referring to the folding heat shield? Yeah, okay, um, I understand. I didn't mean to upset you or insult your work, and everyone here obviously recognizes your tremendous contribution to this field. Um, in the master, original Master Rec plan, there's a very interesting plan for a folding uh, aeroshell uh, system, uh, which is still a blunt body re-entering vehicle with kind of probably a lift to drag ratio around 0.24. Um, and my understanding is that this uh, particular uh, structure uh, or concept suffers uh, some issues, namely um, dismantleable heat shields, um, interesting load paths through hinges. Um, I mean, as an example, if the if the habway is 30 tons and you have a an eight uh, eight spoke something like a deployable umbrella, uh, then you have a load path through each thing, which is the reentry force, which is say six to eight Gs, uh, which is which is therefore equivalent to attempting to lift the entire hab with a cantilevered beam uh, of, of um, somewhat negligible mass uh, at some length through a hinge. Um, and I think it's for this reason that the LDSD architecture looked more at inflatables rather than at kind of folding systems. Um, obviously, I didn't have time in a 30-minute talk to kind of really bore into the finer detail. Um, I'm not saying that a, a folding or deployable heat shield of some kind isn't a possible solution. I mean, obviously, uh, the area, and at very, the very least, the lift has to be increased drastically if you want to drop more than five to 10 tons on the surface. And this is what everyone has known for a long time. But it hasn't, there's still no, I mean, my point, Bob, is there's no dominant architecture. There's no thing that anyone can point to and be like, this is so obviously the correct solution. Everyone has buy-in on it. And uh, I, I apologize that, that didn't, did not come across clearly the first time through. I mean, I'm not really arguing from analogy here. Um, does anyone have a, else have a question? In the front. Okay. So the question is, why aren't humans more expendable? Yeah, why is it so important to you that nobody dies more and more? I, I don't actually think it's that important, and people have already died. Uh, even in developing SpaceX's rockets. I mean, like, there's industrial accidents all the time. Um, I think no one really minds if, if, if people die a hero's death because of something that was understood uh, to be unpredictable. But if you uh, kill astronauts like we did on Apollo 1 uh, because of some flaw that we could have anticipated and should have anticipated, then we didn't really... I, I think we can we can pay our experts and our astronauts a greater deg degree of respect than that. Uh, anyone else? Sorry, we're out of time. I, I look forward to talking to you afterwards. Thank you very much.